We're going to start with this interview that Tucker Carlson did with Colonel Douglas McGregor. There's a lot of other receipts that I have, one with uh, Scott uh, Ritter on another podcast. Then I'm going to show a couple of like more historical videos two, three years ago, just kind of to give you the background of why so much hatred between Iran and the U.S. Let's start here. We seem to be heading to war with Iran. Certainly the Biden administration is pushing us in that direction. What's new and interesting and ominous is that very few Republicans, the opposition party, are pushing back. Instead, some of the party's leaders are encouraging it. Here, for example, is Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina from last weekend on NBC. You said this week that the only way to keep the war from escalating is to hold Iran accountable, part yes. of what you're talking about now, yeah. and that it might mean bombing their oil refineries. Yeah. Have you had any discussions with the Biden administration about this? A, a bit. Here's my message. If Hezbollah, which is a proxy of Iran, launches a massive attack on Israel, I will consider that a threat to the, um, to, to the state of Israel, existential in nature. I will introduce a resolution in the United States Senate to allow military action by the United States in conjunction with Israel to knock Iran out of the oil business. Iran now, let me pause here. Um, because for those of you that may not be so engaged with foreign politics, especially foreign politics about with Iran so much, Iran entering this, um, if you're a Zionist, really makes the make it a possibility that Israel as a state will no longer exist. The colonial project the colonial settler project that we know as Israel, there is a possibility if Iran and their allies and the people, if you know other allies join, Turkey and other people join, there is a there is a real possibility that the end result at the at the end of all the fighting that that is the destruction of the state of Israel. So that's why there's a lot of hand wringing, in particular from conser more conservative people by Iran. They want them to go harder at Iran. But we'll get into more of that of the as the discussion goes on. There is a lot to get into. So let, let me rewind it a little bit and play it some more. Yes. What you're talking about now <laughs> and that it might mean bombing their oil refineries. Yeah. Have you had any discussions with the Biden administration about this? A, a bit. Here's my message. If Hezbollah, which is a proxy of Iran, launches a massive attack on Israel, I will consider that a threat to the um, to to the state of Israel existential in nature. I will introduce a resolution in the United States Senate to allow military action by the United States in conjunction with Israel to knock Iran out of the oil business. Iran, if you escalate this war, we're coming for you. Are you effectively poised to declare war on Iran? That's very strong language. I, I am poised to use military force to destroy the source of funding for Hamas and Hezbollah. No, that's Lindsey Graham. Few others in the Republican Party will be that open about their intentions, but very few disagree with him. Certainly not in private. They agree. So what would war with Iran mean? Well, it's hard to know because virtually no one who's talking about it in public is operating from a deep interest in America's interest. Is this good for us or is it not? Former Colonel Douglas McGregor is the CEO of Our Country, Our Choice, and one of the first people we turn to for analysis of events like this because he is interested in what happens to the United States. He joins us now. Doug, thank you uh, for coming on. Do you think that we are moving toward war with Iran? <clears throat> yes, I do. And uh, it looks like the chosen destination is indeed Armageddon. There doesn't seem to be any real appreciation for the implications for us and, and frankly, for Europe and the world as well as the Middle East of such action. You know, take for an example, just on the economic side, about 20% uh, of the world's oil passes through the Straits of Hormuz every month, uh, uh, probably 25% of liquefied natural gas. And you're talking about shutting down two to three million barrels uh, a day of oil from Iran. Uh, you know, it, this entire region is how would that affect us here, shutting down that amount of oil? How would that affect us? Now, that's a good thing for, well, let me let me back up. How would that affect us? How would that affect your gas prices? 
Now, this shutting down this amount of oil meant that this was better for the economy. That would be great. But the oil will still be extracted. It just would not be coming to us. So, again, these are people in high places with deep pockets making decisions that will be catastrophic to us playing these war games like it's a battleship game. Um, let's get back to the discussion um, as he talks more about Iran involved in the war. This is not an Iranian monopoly by any stretch of the imagination. But the point is that when we're looking at 10-year Treasury yields up over 5%, and people are increasingly convinced that the Fed has lost control, the economic side of the house is catastrophe. Then when you look at the military side, you have to look at the arsenal of missiles that Iran possesses. And they can reach out 1,200 miles with great precision very uh, high explosive conventional warheads that would do enormous damage, destroying whole city blocks in places like Haifa, Tel Aviv, even Jerusalem, though I doubt they would attack Jerusalem. The, the bottom line is that we need to think this through, and everyone right now is emoting. There is no thinking anywhere, as far as I can tell. The only possible exception Maybe, amazingly enough, Mr. Erdogan in Turkey, who came out this morning and indicated he was willing to mediate uh, the dispute between Israel and Hamas. Whether or not anyone in Washington or Israel is interested in talking, I don't know. But if we could sideline Turkey and keep Turkey out of the fight, that would ultimately help Israel enormously. So what would happen to the United States if we followed Senator Graham's advice and just began bombing critical infrastructure in Iran. Like what, what would happen then? Well, all of the bases that we have in Iraq and Syria, unfortunately, where we still have over a thousand Americans, all of those would be targeted. And this time they would target them accurately and this destruction would be wholesale. I would expect trouble here at home and in the United States because of the open border. Hezbollah has a very large operation in Mexico. There are no doubt many, many, many Hezbollah agents inside the United States. We can only begin to imagine the kind of trouble they could cause. The missile and space program in Iran is very, very advanced, as is their cyber warfare capability. All of these things would be brought to bear against us. But what's most important, I think, for Americans to understand is if we attack Iran on the basis of Hezbollah's alleged willingness to attack Israel if Israel invades Gaza, we will end up in a fight with Russia. Russia will not sit by quietly and watch Iran destroyed by the United States air and naval power in the region. And once Russia... So war with Iran, Colonel McGregor saying will likely lead to war also with Russia, meaning like right now we're in war with Russia, but with the proxy. We're talking boots versus boots, boots on the ground there versus our boots on the ground there. This is all for Israel, for a colonial uh, settler pro colonial settler project where we're willing to go to World War Three for, I guess. <laughs> all right. So let's let's uh, listen to a little more and then I'm going to get to some other receipts here and then come back to this interview. here. Russia enters this. Uh, it, it becomes much more than just a local conflict, maybe more than just a regional war. Uh, we haven't thought this through. We need to do that. And I doubt seriously at that point that the Turks would be able to stay out. The Turks are Sunni Muslims. They are the de facto leaders of the Sunni Muslim world. They have the largest armed forces in the region. They are in close proximity to Israel. They could move forces south through Syria very rapidly. And I'm sure Bashar al-Assad, assuming he even survives the opening of this campaign, would not obstruct them. So, so many questions, but just to back up one click, you, you described Iran's missile arsenal, um, but Iran is a country that's been the subject of very intense sanction regime from the United States. I'm going to come back to that because I got another uh, receipt on the sanctions. But let me go back a little bit here. And the question I'm posing is this. Are we looking at the beginning of World War III? We thought it was going to come by way of Ukraine going through China. But because of this is more have, has sort of uh, 
moved up in urgency ahead of Ukraine, this this is the tipping point because and it also and it also is very directly connected to the conditions that Israel is forcing upon the Palestinians. Let's say they were occupiers, but they didn't treat the Palestinians this way. What we have Arab countries talking about, Arab countries, including Arab countries that are allies to us, Jordan and Turkey, talking about sealing, sending in military force to stop this genocide of the Palestinians. Let's continue with the interview um, and listen to what he says here about, is this the beginning of World War III? End up in a fight with Russia. Russia will not sit by quietly and watch Iran destroyed by the United States air and naval power in the region. And once Russia enters this, uh, it, it becomes much more than just a local conflict, maybe more than just a regional war. We haven't thought this through. We need to do that. And I doubt seriously at that point that the Turks would be able to stay out. The Turks are Sunni Muslims. They are the de facto leaders of the Sunni Muslim world. They have the... The Turks. Hezbollah, uh, I think in an interview, Scott Ritter said they have 100,000 troops right there right now. Hezbollah. Then you have Turkey. Like, this This is why I'm telling you this, this is could end up being where we're seeing militarily in a world war, at least a regional war, but it becomes a world war if Russia joins, like he's saying here, because then that draws it, Russia and, and United States is, is involved. And in another, I'm going to get to the other video with Scott Ritter, he says, we can't win a war with Iran. So you understand what that means? That would mean losing a war in Iran would mean that Israel, the destruction and elimination of the state of Israel. And Israel is largely, if not the if not the only reason, there's, there's several other tentacles, but largely the reason for the hatred between the United States and Iran, because Iran doesn't recognize Israel. They think they're, you know, occupiers. They shouldn't even be recognized as a state. And they think they don't they shouldn't exist in Palestine as the state of Israel. And of course, that with United States being the, the the closest ally, that puts you in conflict with that country. So let me actually um, pause here. And I do want to bring a couple of things here. This is Iran's military. So regardless of what Janet Yellen has said in that interview, that the United States can afford to be in all these wars we cannot we can't be in these wars with the goal of winning this is iran's iran's i'm sorry i said iran it says iran's military forces 545 4500 000 active personnel 350,000 reserve personnel 125 men within i think that's like a particular age where they can there be soon be uh able to be eligible so just looking at that number there, that's just Iran. We're not talking about Hezbollah. We're not talking about Jordan. We're not talking about Turkey. This is a disaster for the United States. And it's all because they can't hold back this genocidal uh, state of Israel. If Israel was literally just not killing all these, slaughtering all these civilians, over these decades, I don't mean just now, I mean over the decades, if they haven't been treating the people they're occupying this way, the likelihood of their total destruction would not be on the horizon. And right now, it looks like it could be. They don't want this fight. They absolutely do not want this fight with Iran. Let me bring up another video. I have a couple of here. Now, this is from Redacted. Scott Ritter went on Redacted five days ago or something like that. But let's let's analyze this part. He goes on Redacted, and we're going to uh, watch them talk about uh, war with Iran. And he the, the, um, the quote that you can see that this title says, war with Iran would be suicide and the U.S. will lose. 
conference. So let's listen here. President Xi Jinping threw his support behind Russian President Vladimir Putin and the security of the Russian state military security for Russia. Uh, a congressional report out this morning warning that a war with Russia and China is on the horizon and the U.S. should be prepared. Of course, we covered last night U.S. Foreign Affairs Committee, Mike McCall, Committee Chairman Mike McCall, authorizing President Biden to use force in a war against Iran. The Biden regime has also discussed using military force if Lebanon-based Hezbollah attacks Israel with rockets. All of these things unfolding in a World War III watch right now. We figured we'd bring in former U.N. weapons inspector, former U.S. Marine Scott Ritter, whose analysis on geopolitics and everything going on with these uh, strategic war rhetoric right now is so important. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So I guess maybe we start with just a few minutes ago, Xi Jinping throwing security support behind Russia. And what does this mean with this new congressional report warning that Russia and China a war with both of those countries simultaneously is on the horizon. <laughs> well, first of all, let's talk about what Xi Jinping has done. Um, you know, China and Russia, of course, have a relationship that's uh, that's uh, superior to any uh, treaty relationship. Uh, it's a, a relationship without any boundaries. This is what they've been saying. But there's been some boundaries. I mean, China has been a little bit reticent about uh, Russia's uh, military incursion into Ukraine. It uh, violates China's Westphalian principles of sovereignty and things of that nature. Um, but I think China has been compelled to reassess its uh, posture, uh, not by Russia's actions, but by the collective West's actions, that China now recognizes that this struggle between Russia in Ukraine isn't about Russia against Ukraine. It's about Russia against the collective West, against mm. NATO, against the United States. And then China has to evaluate the uh, rhetoric and the actions that have been coming out of the United States, its European allies, uh, its Asian allies, in regard to China, uh, the strangulation of China that they're trying to do economically and geopolitically. And China... I think has realized that um, the best way to protect China is to align China militarily secure from a security standpoint with the other nation that is lined up against the same enemy set that China is facing. And that's Russia. And this is a huge deal because it's mm -hmm. not that China's military is going to be coming over the borders. I mean, I think you'll see some, uh, uh, Chinese assistance from a uh, from a material standpoint. You'll and I think uh, I do want to insert this because there is a connection why they're talking about this part before they get to the to the Iran part. But you notice there's a lot less coverage in mainstream media, corporate media, I should say, not mainstream. Independent news is what's mainstream. Uh, corporate media they haven't been covering Iran. It's like they've moved off of uh i'm sorry not iran they haven't been covering uh ukraine and it's it's not like they've moved off of it but they clearly have put ukraine at the chat at the children's table and move israel to the adult table but let's let them uh, uh make the point of, about china and russia and connect it to to iran i think you'll see some of this you'll see closer cooperation between russia and china it won't be a one-way street russia has some technology it can offer china that will be uh devastating Oh, another thing I wanted to mention. So, again, I said this, I think I alluded to this earlier. So we're supposed to be getting in an, uh, so we're going to get in a, a war with Russia, China, Iran, and if Jordan and Turkey gets, that's, that's what we're doing now? And wait till he gets to how we're going to feel that many people. We're, we would have to, there would have to be a very large uptick in military recruitment. And have it, if you haven't heard, Military recruitment is down now. So let's listen uh, more of Scott. Dating to America, if China ever incorporates it. Um, but more, more importantly, it's about the, the fact that Russia is no longer alone, uh, that China now has says, we support what you're doing. We're on your side. We're on Team Putin uh, when it comes to Ukraine, when it comes to the world, the global position. This is bad news for uh, those in the United States who are trying to resurrect Cold War fantasies of being able to uh, wage and win two wars simultaneously. 
you know, back when I was in the Marine Corps, we actually had a, a posture of, of fighting two and a half wars. The, the way the United States was configured militarily, <clears throat> we could fight a war in Europe using NATO and defeat the Soviet Union. At the same time, we could fight our major war in the Pacific, probably North Korea, and defeat the North Korean Chinese threat and still have sufficient force to engage in a smaller war, say in the Middle East, where we would fight a holding action until we won one of the two major wars and diverted the resources in to win the half war. And we had the force. So that's two and a half. He's saying at his time, it was a belief or understanding that we could do two and, two and a half wars. And he's counting the one that NATO, that's NATO led supposedly as one of those wars. And then we could fight a full one or just ourselves and then have some sort of other smaller sort of conflict somewhere else. But again, remember who the people, the players, I said, <laughs> Russia, China. Now we're going to add, that's two. And now we're going to add, and this is back in the day. We're going to see if he says that's still, if it's still two and a half even now. This is back when he was in the Marine. So this is several decades ago. But let's listen. Forces to do that. We trained to do it. We were ready to do it. And uh, thank God we never had to do it, but I think we could have done it. Um, today, we, you know, we went from two and a half to two wars. Today, we're down to literally one war and we can't even do one war. Let's be honest. If we went to war right now in Europe against Russia, we don't have sufficient military force to prevail. We can fight a war. We can't win a war. If we went to war, is that ever the United States military industrial complex? Is that ever their goal to win? I think um, Julian Assange said that it's never the goal to win. It's just to launder the money. But let's listen to some more to some more of what Scott says. Went to war against China. Uh, we could fight a war, but we can't win it. And that's even if we bring the totality of our conventional strength into play. And now we're talking about doing it against both Russia and China. The costs that are going to be associated with this are phenomenal. First of all, it's going to require a massive expansion of our conventional military power. The United States Army just had a shortfall in recruiting. There, They are literally tens of thousands of pe personnel short of what their authorized manning strength is, which means instead of expanding the U.S. Army, they have to shrink it. They don't have enough men or women to fill the ranks. And so certain units, certain capabilities are being taken down to zero because you don't have manpower to, to do this. And now Congress is talking about beefing up with what? Are you going to go to a draft? Have you run that by the American people? Is it really smart for the United States? How would that go? How would that go for Joe Biden to come out and to announce it's time to go into a wartime mo a position? We're bringing back the draft. How many of you would be sending your 18 to, I don't know, what are they taking, up to 24? It's usually range, 25, something like that. How many of you who have kids in that range or have brothers in that range or sisters in that range or a person, a family member, a friend in that range, in military range, what will be your reaction to them being drafted? Would that be something that would get you out into the streets protesting? I know that would get me. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. I love my audience. This is why I always look to when I when it gets to the numbers, I look to you to see if this to the chat to see if anybody give me something I can put up here. And you did military age 18 to 25. There you go. So I know I have a son that falls into that age range and that ain't happening, Katney. That ain't happening. That is not happening whatsoever. Uh, but let's let's continue um, here. United States to talk about fighting a two war. Do we know what that means? It means that America has to leave our continental fortress, go across the oceans to fight a war over there in their backyard. In their backyard. That means we're taking Russia on, you know, in a confrontation in Europe where Russia's logistics are literally right there next to them. They're supplying themselves from interior lines of communication. We will have to extend ourselves. 
We don't have sufficient logistical buildup in Europe anymore. That would cost billions to do that. That means we have to sustain from the United States with lengthy supply lines. It's literally suicidal. So this is insane. Biden's talking about, they're talking about potential conflict with Iran. We can't fight Iran. We don't have the forces to do that. You know, we fought the Gulf War in 1991 by having friendly ports and airfields that we could drink, bring our ships into and offload in an uncontested fashion and land and offload troops. How are we going to do that in a war with Iran? They're going to blow up every port, blow up every airfield. It means now we have to do a forcible entry into an Iranian port, Chabahar, Bandar Abbas. We don't have the force structure to do that. Iran has missiles that will sink our ships before we get there. They're parking two. I mean, I mean, really the analysis that we're all sort of listening to and that we're all sort of been talking about, this, this is what a collapsing empire looks like. Spreading themselves way too thin because they still think they're in the prime of their, imp- of their empiring, of their imperialism, when they're not. And I mean, four, five wars? Like, what are we doing here? What are we doing, really? Let's continue. Two aircraft carrier battle groups off the coast of Lebanon with a, uh, you know, a 2,000 uh, man uh, amphibious ready group to fight Hezbollah. Hezbollah's 100,000 men, highly trained, dug in to the hills of southern Lebanon who have been preparing for this fight. We have gone insane. Let me just make it very clear. Hezbollah, which I believe is it Lebanon? Yeah, which is the uh, they're part of Lebanon. Um, the UN does not classify Hezbollah nor uh, Hamas as a terrorist group. That is solely classification by the United States and Western allies. Um, Hezbollah has a hundred thousand troops that's ready to come in from the north into Israel. You see what I'm saying? Like this, this is literally would be all she wrote. And it's because it's, this is Zionism causing its own destruction because Zionism has, is, I'm not going to say has become, it's always been this way, has, is so brutal and inhumane. There's plenty places that is being occupied that is part of a territory or colonized, but they're not uh, constantly murdering civilians and babies. Like, I don't, I don't see what the end game is here. And I think that that's the reason why there's a pause in them going into Gaza. Not, I think, but there is a pause in them going into Gaza because the United States, I think, can kind of see this. Like, this is not going to end well here. Israel, maybe you should rethink this. We, You need to have clear goals here. You keep hearing that in mainstream media. You keep ha- you, you want to hear clear goals, or the United States keeps saying, we need to hear clear goals for what, what is achievable for, the Uni- for, for Israel. This is not looking good here. But let's continue with Scott. America can't fight and win a war anywhere in the world right now against any power that has any military capability we're that weak we are literally that weak we can't even stop people coming across our own southern border to the tune of 10 to 15,000 people per day so we can really extend ourselves going all the way to china or iran and turning of course former allies i suppose in saudi arabia against us as well uh, the biden administration getting the cold shoulder from saudi arabia uh, but the biden administration seems keen on raising another 100 billion dollars for the war in Ukraine and to funnel money into Israel. Over the past uh, 24 hours, Zelensky on the Ukrainian side has said, see all of these. They go into some other items here. So I'm going to bring up my other receipt. Now, I I do want to kind of look at this one here. Now, what I do want to go to is kind of like the backstory. What the backstory with, with the United States and Iran and then swing it back around to the interview with uh, Tucker Carlson here. Now, if you don't, if you remember not too long ago when, when Donald Trump was in office, he was the one that killed one of the generals in Iran, or of Iran, I should say. This is the one of the latest major escalations between 
the hatred between the United States and um, Iran. The strike killing Soleimani was a major escalation in the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign on Iran. Up until now, that campaign largely relied on crippling economic sanctions. So how do we get from economic pressure to military might? Dasha Burns takes us back a few weeks to explain. Tensions with Iran have reached a fever pitch. The last week has seen a series of escalating events that has brought us to where we are today. So let's check the timeline and mark the major moments, starting with Friday, December 27th, when a U.S. contractor is killed and other service members are wounded during a rocket attack on a military base in northern Iran. Well, now understand the videos that I, some of the videos I have is from a corporate entity. So it's going to be have colorful adjectives and things like that. I'm more so showing you so you can see factual things like dates and things that actually factually you can just say was not a, no description. But just to give you a heads up, they're going to have a lot of colorful, you know, propaganda language and understand I, I listen to it and I know it's there. So just giving you a, a warning. In Iraq. Then two days later, on December 29th, the U.S. carries out airstrikes aimed at Iran-backed militias in Iraq and Syria, which U.S. officials blame for 11 recent attacks on U.S.-led coalition bases, including the one on December 27th. At least 25 militia fighters are killed in the strikes. Then on December 31st, New Year's Eve, thousands of pro-Iran protesters stormed the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad to demonstrate against the airstrikes. They tried burning down entry gates, reaching as far as the reception area. Trump blames Iran for the break-in and says they will pay a very big price. This will never, ever be a Benghazi. The next day, Iraqi forces, along with U.S. Marines, work together to secure the area and disperse the protest. There are no reports of casualties, but Defense Secretary Mark Esper orders over 700 troops to deploy to the area, with many more on standby. And that brings us to the biggest event of the week. On Thursday night, U.S. time and early Friday morning in Iraq, General Qasem Soleimani, a high-profile Iranian general, is killed by a U.S. airstrike at Baghdad International Airport. Soleimani led the Quds Force under Iran's Revolutionary Guard, which is widely believed to support terrorist groups such as Hezbollah. The Pentagon says Soleimani organized... Again, uh, Hezbollah it is not labeled a terrorist group, but anybody from anybody but the United States and West. Attacks on U.S. coalition bases in Iraq over the last several months, including the December 27th rocket attack. Then this morning, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei says there will be harsh retaliation. The U.S. State Department closes the embassy in Baghdad and tells Americans to leave Iraq immediately. And we learn that approximately 3,000 additional troops are being deployed to the Middle East. President Trump's decision to remove Qasem Soleimani from the battlefield saved American lives. He was actively plotting in the region to take actions, a big action as he described it, that would have put dozens if not hundreds of American lives at risk. There are conflicting reactions in the region. Iraqis celebrate Soleimani's death in Baghdad while protesters demonstrate against the U.S. in Tehran. <laughs> Meanwhile, Democrats in Congress express concern over more potential violence and Trump's unilateral action. This action may well have brought our nation closer to another endless war. And as for the White House, here's what the president had to say in his first public appearance after the airstrike. We took action last night to stop a war. We did not take action to start a war. Killing generals don't start wars, I guess. <laughs> right? That's they're telling us. Killing generals. Is that what they said his position was? A general? Um, that doesn't start wars. Um, and there is another video, um, I, a couple other videos I want to show you too. The Soleimani, I guess my computer is so delayed. Right now, I'm like, I thought I hit that already. people are in Iran together as the body of slain General Qasem uh, Soleimani makes its way through the streets. Earlier, dozens of Iranian lawmakers chanted death to America as they met in parliament. <sighs> Could you imagine? <laughs> uh, Nancy Pelosi and I don't know, Bernie Sanders and 
standing side by side with Republicans chanting. <laughs> uh, that would be a funny sight to see. But back to the video. Just I had that flash uh, over my head, my mind when I was watching this. Let's get now to CNN. Fred Feitkin uh, He's reported extensively on Iran and joins us now from Tehran. And Frederick, uh, those chants are just a bit of the dramatic moment from uh, that uh, that session. Also, we've now got this exclusive reporting from you on what the potential response will be from Iran. Yeah, exactly, Victor. And, you know, one of the things that we've heard pretty much from all levels of politics here in Iran and from the military as well is that Iran is going to retaliate. There will be a response and there will be revenge. We heard that from Iran's supreme leader, from Iran's president uh, as well. So I spoke to the main military advisor of Iran's supreme leader, someone who's extremely high in the hierarchy and very close to the power center of this country. And I asked uh, Hossein Degan, what exactly is the response going to be? And he said there will be a response that will be a military response and it will be against military targets, but that Iran does not want a wider war with the United States. Let's listen in. The response for sure will be military and against military sites. Let me tell you one thing. Our leadership has officially announced that we've never been seeking war and we will not be seeking war. It was America that has started the war. Therefore, they should accept appropriate reactions to their actions. The only thing that can end this period of war is for the Americans to receive a blow that is equal to the blow they've inflicted. Afterwards, they should not seek a new cycle. I think we're going to stop there on that report. I do want to speed this up and get through some of these other receipts here. Now, I do want to cover one more thing before we get back to the Tucker Carlson video, and that's because they're talking. The question we left off with is sanctions. How is Iran able to do these things? How is Iran able to go to war with us if there's sanctions on them? So let's let Al Jazeera English tell us, do sanctions against Iran work and again this is corporate Talk about so US sanctions from Iran because the US president keeps piling them on powerful sanctions will go into full effect but Iran isn't bowing now according to this online tracker America has more sanctions against Iran than it does on North Korea Cuba Venezuela and Libya combined so what exactly are those sanctions and more importantly are they working? The big picture is this. The U.S. and Iran are in a way at war. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. But they don't fight face to face. Instead, they antagonize each other. Iran gets involved in conflicts around the Middle East by backing armed groups and U.S rivals like Russia, and the U.S.'s main weapon, sanctions. Now, the simple definition of a sanction is an official order taken against a country in order to make it obey international law. That could include bans on travel, transactions, or trade. And in Iran's case, it's all of those. Any kind of exchange that directly or indirectly might benefit the Iranian government or any agency of it or any individual who may directly or indirectly be affiliated with it is prohibited under American law. Now we've read the US Treasury's blacklist for Iran and it is long. Mm. The big ones are a ban on Iran's biggest industry, which is oil, and a ban on any kind of financial transactions with Iran. Plus its entire steel, mining, coal sectors, dozens of individual people and ministries in Iran's government, banks, insurance, construction companies, ships, and aircraft. There's even a ban on Persian carpets, one of Iran's biggest exports, and its pistachio industry. Now, the penalties for violating those sanctions are serious. The U.S. government can fine a person or company up to $1 million or hand down a 20-year jail sentence, even if they're not American. Because the U.S. has such a strong dollar and so many transactions are conducted in dollars, it means that U.S. sanctions 
would affect any EU company doing business with Iran. Between having sanctions on its main industries and being blocked from trading with other countries, Iran has become one of the most isolated economies in the world. So when did this sanctions war start? More than 40 years ago. The U.S. long supported Iran's monarch, the Shah. But in 1979, the Islamic Revolution swept cleric Ayatollah Khomeini to power. A group of Iranian revolutionaries stormed the U.S. embassy and imprisoned its staff for over a year. That led to the very first round of sanctions on Iran, with the U.S. freezing billions of dollars in Iranian government assets. And it was just the beginning. Over the next seven so this goes back to what 1979 i believe she said so this is long standing um and sort of sort sort of the bad relationship went it went from good to bad around there 1970s late 1970s and it's all because it went from a circular or secular secular sort of uh uh muslim state to a Islamic, a very a, a uh, theocratic sort of state. Um, and then those people who came into power kicked all of the U.S. influence out and, you know, uh, removed itself. And of course, the U.S. didn't like this. So that was the beginning sort of stage stages. Now, let's get back to um, the interview with Tucker Carlson Oops, here it goes. Tucker Carlson and um, Colonel Douglas McGregor. I'm going to go back 10 seconds so he can say the question again about uh, sanctions. Regional war. We haven't thought this through. We need to do that. And I doubt seriously at that point that the Turks would be able to stay out. The Turks are Sunni Muslims. They are the de facto leaders of the Sunni Muslim world. They have the largest armed forces in the region. They are in close proximity to Israel. They could move forces south through Syria very rapidly. And I'm sure Bashar al-Assad, assuming he even survives the opening of this campaign, would not obstruct them. So, so many questions, but just to back up one click, you, you described Iran's missile arsenal. Um, but Iran is a country that's been the subject of very intense sanction regime from the United States, in increased by the last president, Donald Trump. Um, but for a long time, how is Iran still such a powerful country militarily given those sanctions? It sounds like maybe they didn't work. Oh, no, I think that's that's an important point, Tucker, and you're absolutely right. We place so much value on these sanctions and assume that they have this profound impact. Normally, sanctions harm the population in terms of lowering its standard of living, making life more difficult for the everyday citizen, but it doesn't fundamentally alter the policy or the goals and objectives of the government. And this is something that I don't think we understand. And the same thing is true for, for Hamas and Gaza. You know, you, you want to go after Hamas. You want to destroy it. I think everyone with a sound mind is interested in the destruction of Hamas. But do you want to kill hundreds of thousands of people in order to get at Hamas? That's the question. We have the same problem in Iran. Our sanctions have not harmed the regime's ability to develop and build very, very complex and sophisticated missiles. These missiles are very accurate now. There are hundreds, if not thousands. And the long-range missiles, the 1,200-mile range theater ballistic missiles, are a very serious threat to us in the region and to Israel. And the sanctions have had no impact there. If anything, the Iranians have pulled together the best human capital in their country, the best engineers, the best thinkers, and put them to work primarily on missile technology and on cyber warfare. And that's where we stand right now. We have to expect the worst as a result if we strike Iran. How is the U.S. military, do you think, having spent your life in it, leading troops in combat and at the Pentagon, positioned to respond to war with, with Iran right now? Are we in a strong position or not, in your view? No, I don't think we're in a strong position. I think we're probably at the weakest point in uh, our recent history. Now, uh, 
I'm sure I've seen Scott Ritter and Colonel McGregor on the same podcast before. But these are two former military people saying essentially the same thing. The critique is not only, not only are we not ready. I was trying to clean the dust off, but it turned the mic off. Not only are we um, not ready for war uh, with Iran, but both of them give the critique that we are at our weakest point that they've seen in decades. Both of them make that assessment. So let's uh, let's continue. Okay, this Tucker one right here. All right. Uh, I think you've got to look at the realities of new weapon systems, new capabilities. The United States Navy, if it's going to preserve its capability at sea, is probably going to be compelled to operate somewhere north and west of Sicily. If it comes within closer range, then it falls into this envelope where the Iranians can strike it. And as I said before, we have to assume the Russians will come into this. Once you move into the eastern Mediterranean, you are vulnerable to the Kinshaw missiles and other missiles, cruise missiles and hypersonic missiles that the Russians have. This makes it very difficult to fly strikes in support of the Israeli Defense Force against Hezbollah, because now you're flying a very long distance. You deliver your ordnance. You have to land in Israel in order to refuel. Israel is going to operate under a hail if not a rainstorm of missiles and rockets, making it very, very dangerous to do so. So our naval power, while substantial, may not have the desired impact on the ground that we would like. And then finally, we have no real army anymore. The army is down to perhaps, what, 450,000? How much of that is ready to fight is open to debate. Much of it is sitting in Eastern Europe right now. We, we don't have the means to rapidly ship a large force of 80 to 100,000 troops on the ground into the region, which means that we're reliant on special forces and right now 2,000 Marines and perhaps 2,000 special forces and special operations forces. That's not going to make much of a dent. And as we've seen quite recently within the last 24 hours or so, uh, some of our special ops forces and Israeli special ops forces went into Gaza to reconnoiter, to plan for where they might want to go to free hostages and, and make an impact. And they were shot to pieces and took heavy losses, as I understand it. I think that's where we're headed. And I don't see that as a win for Israel in any way, shape or form. And I certainly think it's very dangerous for us. You know, as I've tried to point out to a number of people, until Britain en entered World War I, it was just a, another European war. Once Britain entered it, it became a global war. Well, once we are a co-belligerent, we enter this thing, it's going to be very difficult for Russia and Turkey not to also come into this fight against us because they will not tolerate the sort of collective punishment that Israel plans for Gaza. The U.S. military does have an you awful lot of generals, however, as you pointed out, multiples of the number we had, the absolute number we had during World War II. Um, and they're paid to think about this stuff. Why has it dawned on no one, apparently, who's spoken publicly anyway, that this this could this could really harm our country gravely? Why is no one saying that? Well, I'm sure there are people in the U.S. military who are aware, but let's be frank. Uh, most of the people at the top of the military have never operated under artillery fire or rocket fire. They haven't seen direct fire combat. They haven't seen real war per se. Remember, we've had the luxury of sitting around forward operating bases and striking opponents that were armed with AK-47s and command detonated mines, an occasional mortar or rocket. Very, very low intensity combat. This is a high end conventional war that we're looking at with the potential to go nuclear, which obviously I don't mm. think we or the Russians want to happen. But we have the wild card in Israel. They do have a nuclear capability. We don't know what the tripwire is for them to employ such a weapon. At that point, of course, all bets are off. And, and I think most of the world would turn against Israel. Right now, they just have to worry about the Muslim world against them. It would certainly widen if they went that far. <clears throat> this, there are too many unknowns and uncertainties here. And, you know, everyone always assumes at the beginning of such a conflict, well, it'll be contained. We'll only have to fight these people, Hamas, maybe Hezbollah. 
It never works out that way. These things always last longer than everyone thinks. The resources required are much more profound than what we anticipated. And remember, we've already used up many of our war stocks in Ukraine. And we've left Ukraine yeah. in a state of ruins. Places on life support, a half a million dead. What are we going to do to Israel if we press ahead down this road? And it seems, listening to Secretary of State Blinken this morning, who more and more sounds like our commander in chief, that there is no room for negotiation, no room for mediation. Hamas must be destroyed. We must go into Gaza. If so, I think we're on this very dangerous road to Armageddon. What is the objective of the IDF and of? So I do want to bring up, man, we're kind of done here. I'm at the 13 minute mark. I can remember that 13 minute mark. Cause I do want to bring up another receipt here. He alluded to Anthony Blinken. So I do want to show what Anthony Blinken said at the UN here. So let's insert Anthony Blinken right here. It is no secret to anyone in this room or on this council that for years, Iran has supported Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and other groups that continue to carry out attacks on Israel. Iranian leaders have routinely threatened to wipe Israel off the map. In recent weeks, Iran's proxies have repeatedly attacked U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria, whose mission is to prevent ISIS from renewing its rampage. So let me say this before this council, and let me say what we've consistently said to Iranian officials through other channels. The United States does not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want this war to widen. But if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere, make no mistake, we will defend our people, we will defend our security swiftly and decisively. To all the members of this council, if you, like the United States, want to prevent this conflict from spreading, tell Iran, tell its proxies, in public, in private, through every means, do not open another front against Israel in this conflict. Do not attack Israel's partners. So that's what Antony Blinken um I said, and I'll get back to the to the interview there. Thirteen minute mark is what I have to it is remember. No we were left off, but let's listen to what um, you heard, Anthony Blinken. But they're bringing back some of the old neocons, and here is Joe Lieberman on uh, Fox Business, and he's talking about this conflict. And this George Me Lieberman. Um, let me just let him and speak. Iran, it's time for the U.S. military to strike. Unhinge. I guess they don't have enough unhinged current politicians. So they say, hey, let's go back to the good old days and get George Lieberman. What I'm saying, in short, is that we can't elect the commanders of all this death, uh, anti-American action in uh, the Middle East to, to, to feel like they're in some safe sanctuary in Iran. It's time for the U.S. military to strike IRGC uh, facilities, missile factories, drone factories in Iran and let them know that we know that uh, the, the Iranians are behind this and we're not going to let them get away with it anymore. So, so just to be clear, you think that the U.S. should strike Iran right now? I do, because none of this, Hamas would not be Hamas without uh, Iran's support. Uh, that, that they're, they're a terrorist agent of Iran, uh, which calls yeah. us still the great Satan and Israel uh, the little Satan. And the same is true of Hezbollah, yeah. the Houthis yeah. in Yemen, the all the rest. Yeah. And they're getting away yeah. literally with yeah. murder, yeah. including yeah. murder of Americans. Unless we make them pay for this soon, now, they will kill some American military personnel uh, in Iraq, and uh, it, it's nothing new for them. The uh, the uh, this Iranian government has the blood of Americans on their hands through their terrorist proxies and directly going back uh, decades. And it, and it's time to just acknowledge uh, the the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran 
is our enemy. You can't trust them. You can't assume that we're going to make them friends. You can't make deals with them. We have to hit them hard or they will continue to cause uh, death and destruction for us and our allies like Israel and our allies in the Arab world like Saudi Arabia. Oh, that's just Joe Lieberman going unhinged for World War Three. Uh, World War Three. That's all. That's that's nothing else. <laughs> all right. So let me. Uh, I am going to prep that, but I do want to go to something else here and show you another receipt here. I might get back to that interview with Tucker Carlson. We'll see. Um, but let's continue now and tell this, this story of uh, what's happening in with the war with uh, with uh, Iran. Um, now, this is recent responding. So you saw Anthony Blinken talking about Hamas connection with 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 Iran. And this is um, Iran responding to that. And then um, uh, let's just start there. Dorset Jabari joins us live from Tehran. Dorsa, Iran is being accused of helping plan Hamas's surprise attack on Saturday. We've since heard from the Iranian foreign ministry and it had some strong words. Talk us through it. Yes, uh, during his weekly uh, press briefing, the spokesperson, uh, Nasser Kanani, uh, dismissed the allegations uh, and he said that the Palestinian people have the will, the capability and the determination to defend themselves and uh, any allegations that are coming towards Iran are politically motivated and they are aimed uh, at diverting public opinion to justify any possible actions on Iran in the future. He also said if there were to be any um, actions taken against Iran when it comes to their um, the allegations that they had a possible role in planning and um, assisting uh, the attacks that were carried out on Saturday and continue to this day in Palestine and Israel, uh, the, that Iran will respond harshly and that this is not something that um, is even uh, remotely possible in the minds of the establishment here, that what happened uh, in Palestine had to do with years of uh, occupation and oppression, mm. and that was the result of um, not only Israeli policy, but also what many here believe to be uh, Western policies towards the Palestinian people. Explain to our international audience the historical context of all of this, why Iran is in some ways a major player uh, in this region. Well, Iran, since the revolution of 1979, has uh, really yeah. seen itself... 1979, there's that number again. Um, ...in the Middle East. It is a Shia-majority country. So <clears throat> there was a number of steps taken by the founder of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, to ensure that Iran's position maintains uh, secure. One of them was to align itself with other resistance groups, um, not just Shia resistance groups like Hezbollah, but also like Hamas and Islamic Jihad, to ensure their own uh, existence down the line. And the existence of Israel has always been... <clears throat> a point of contention for Iran. They believe that they don't believe Israel has a right to exist as a nation, saying, a country, yes. and they've never acknowledged uh, that uh, to be the case. They say Palestine is um, a country that has been oppressed. So there's a lot of different factors at play. Uh, at the core of it, of course, it's the their own existence, the Iran's own security and existence down the line in the Middle East and the role that they have played. And they believe that the Palestinian issue has always been an important one for them because it also not only um, serves the Palestinian people and the nation, but also their own purpose as well in terms of their own existence down the line. So there's been a lot of different groups and elements that Iran has aligned itself with to serve that purpose. Appreciate you breaking all down for us. So Iran, Iran or the revolution in Iran there was two movements that they decided to connect themselves with. Both of them was apartheid movements, one in Israel or Palestine, because they don't recognize Israel, and the other in South Africa. So, for, again, from the beginning, this has been the relationship. So when you're thinking, why does Iran hate the U.S. and vice versa? This is from the jump. 
1979, that's the year where it flipped from good to bad as far as the relationship. And then, you know, just different events throughout uh, history. Soleimani was one of the most recent ones of escalation. Now this interview flips to another person. And I, but let me wait for him to introduce his name, but I retweet him all the time. For us, Dulce Jabari in Tehran. Mohammed Mirandi, who is... Mohammed Mirandi. We retweet him all the time. He's out of University of Tehran, tweets a lot about Iran, and we retweet him all the time. He's a political analyst and a professor at the University of Tehran. He joins us from the Iranian capital. Thanks so much for being on the program. Explain to our international audience the relationship between Iran and Israel and why Tehran is being accused of having, quote, tentacles all over this attack by Hamas. Iran's support for the Palestinian people uh, is linked to uh, the revolution itself. During the revolution, there were two causes that the Iranians were very much focused on. One was supporting the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and the second was supporting the dispossessed Palestinian people across Palestine. And uh, at that time, Western countries were supporting both the apartheid regime in South Africa and the Israeli regime. Isn't that something? Nelson Mandela, the ANC, and others were all terrorist organizations in Western capitals. So Iran's support for Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, and other resistance groups is because they have a legitimate cause. They've been dispossessed. They've been colonized. They've been ethnically cleansed. And the people who are trapped in Gaza, in this ghetto, uh, they have been dispossessed from their land okay. uh, across southern Palestine. Uh, I guess I want to look at the broader context of this and what it means in terms of Hezbollah and Hamas, um, the Lebanese militant group being involved in the broader implications regionally. Could we see this conflict now spilling out uh, further in the region? It is quite possible because we are seeing the genocidal tendencies of the Israeli regime playing out as they indiscriminately bomb homes and murder women and children across Gaza. And Western media, they all are justifying it because they've all been justifying the actions of the apartheid settler regime for decades. And uh, as we speak, people are being massacred. Last night, they were being massacred. Towers have been raised to the ground, and constantly Western media outlets have been trying to justify all this because they side with the Israeli regime. It is the responsibility of Iran and Iranians and people across the region and across the globe to stand up for the dispossessed and not to be fooled by these Western narratives. Hezbollah supports Hamas because they are victims. Hezbollah supports the Palestinian people because these are victims. And Hezbollah is much stronger than Hamas, by the way. It is not surrounded. So I just want to, sir, I just want to interrupt. You notice, you notice, you notice, this is a corporate organization. Al Jazeera uh, English. They're better than most places. But again, you heard he was saying a bunch of stuff called uh, about Israel and apartheid. And you heard she started shuffling papers. Don't really hear want to hear this part. She wants to you just answer the questions I got. Stop inserting this 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 uh, U.S. Empire stuff because we got bills to pay here from from our uh, owners and donors. So uh, let's listen. Or advertisers, not donors. Um. We've heard from from the, the Iran Foreign Ministry, sorry, the, the information is just flowing in as I speak to you. The Iran Foreign Ministry has said any foolish Israeli action against Iran will be met with a devastating response. We're already facing a war between Gaza and Israel, and now we're getting threats like that. Your response? Well, the Americans or American officials have been threatening Iran as well. And I think that the Americans know quite well that they've already bitten off more than they can chew in Ukraine, in East Asia with China. The United States and its allies are on the decline. They, they're not the powers that they were 30, 40 years ago. The Israeli regime is in no position to 
threaten Iran because the Israeli regime cannot even destroy the Palestinian people. But the United States, if it does something foolish, then it will be expelled from the region. The United States is very vulnerable. And the price of fuel will go through the roof. It will destroy the Western economies. Mm. Okay. And then you'll be seeing you see. violence <laughs> oh, we gotta get out here. Europe and North America. Sorry, we just have to cut it short there. We're running um, short. They're always running short when you're telling a bunch of truths. You notice that? They always, oh, wait, wait, we got to go. We're running out of time here. They always, they always uh, sort of lean on that. I think I've covered all of my receipts on YouTube. I want to make sure. If I can able to close my YouTube tabs. I covered that, 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 yeah. This one, Fox News. Let's get their take on this. They're always unhinged. Let's see if it's anything different. This was two weeks ago. Iran has, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Meanwhile, Hezbollah's leader meeting with eight hours ago from Hamas and the that was an old video. Islamic this is eight hours ago earlier today. As the Israeli Air Force says, it conducted airstrikes in the West Bank and Syria overnight. Joining me right now is Center for American Security co-chairman, Fox News contributor, and from a national security advisor to Vice President Mike Pence. He is the author of War by Other Means, a general in the Trump White House. Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg back with us. Lieutenant General, good to see you. Thanks very much. Give us your reaction. Always to selling reports. books. They're always selling books. Yeah, good morning, Maria, and thanks for having me. I think he's right on the spot. And what, and what he's talking about primarily, let's look at Hamas. And, and the Gaza Strip right now. Uh, I think what the Israelis are doing, which is smart, is they're actually preparing the battlefield for an invasion eventually into Gaza by ground troops, which is going to be really hard. And they're probably training up for it. There's a huge training facility in the southern desert in Israel called Zilam. Well, it's about a 600 building facility. In fact, they call it Mini Gaza. And that's where they're probably training up to go in. And they're using munitions right now, like artillery and air, to basically soften up the battlefield. And they're also looking at the same time, trying to figure a way with Qatar or other nations how to get the hostages out. And there's still about 200, to about 12 Americans, we believe, are still held hostage. And they're trying to get them released or at least moved to a more secure location before they go in. The Israelis are going to go in. There's no doubt about it. They're just preparing the battlefield correctly to do it. Yeah. And then when Trey made the comment, which was correct about the Hezbollah to the north. We're trying to keep the we in the United States with our pressure on Iran is trying to keep Hezbollah out of this fight as well. And we have influence on Iran through force if necessary. And, and what we don't want Hezbollah to do, Maria, is actually open up a second front on Israel. Let the Israelis fight the fight with Hamas in the south. Hold on to That's the north, exactly what they're going to do. And, and, and I guess that is up to Iran, right? I mean, th this th this latest uh, mm -hmm. warning from Blinken is quite stunning. I mean, the Pentagon confirmed that U.S. troops in the Middle East have now been attacked 14 times. Uh, they're attacked yeah. by drones or rockets just in the last week. 24 people have been injured as a result. Troops in Iraq being targeted in 11 uh, separate attacks, while U.S. forces in Syria have also been attacked three times. Pentagon officials said Monday that the attacks have Iran's fingerprints all over them. And then we hear from Secretary of State Anthony Blinken on it. He issued a warning to Iran about this at the U.N. Security Council yesterday. Let's take a listen. Watch. The United States does not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want this war to widen. But if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere, make no mistake, we will defend our people, we will defend our security swiftly and decisively. General, your reaction? Yeah, here's the mistake, Maria. The mistake is that that is should, should have been issued by the President of the United States. Mm. Look, I remember quite clearly when the President was at the State of the Union, and, and in the State of the Union, he said quite clearly, if you attack, not kill, if you attack an American, you forfeit your life. That came from the President. The President needs to make those comments. He's the Commander-in-Chief. He's the one who will release military forces if needed. And Iran should be, everybody should understand, make it very clear to Iran. We know they've got their hands on Hezbollah and Hamas as well. And they need to understand, if Hezbollah enters this fight, you are culpable and we are going to come after you. But Blinken, and Blinken's coming. And they don't seem to be scared at all. I mean, 
that's actually what I think it's going to happen, especially when the images or especially when it becomes clear that the any incursion or any invasion into Gaza is just nothing but slaughtering, you know, babies and kids. I mean, how are you going to avoid that? Because as to as uh, did we get to that part? Oh, we haven't gotten to that part in the Tucker Carlson, so I won't refer to it. But let's uh, listen to a little more of this, and then we'll get back. His comments were very good, but the wrong person issued the comments. Yeah, those need to come from the White House. Those need to come from the President of the United States. Yeah, you're the right. Commander in Chief. Th that is spot on. Uh, do you think we could go to war with Iran? Well, I don't think it would be. I, the answer is yes. I, we should be able to do it, and they should believe that because they should fear us and they should mm -hmm. respect us, not just say, well, we really don't believe they're going to do it. Yeah. We have enough combat capability in the Mediterranean to do something. And Iran and the Supreme Leader Khamenei needs to understand, if you come after us, we're going to come after you. Look, Maria, well, they're over 30 coming, Americans I mean, have been killed. There have a lot of attacks. Over hostages. There have been a lot of attacks on U.S. Right. troops. Now, the U.S. is planning to send Iron Dome missile defense systems uh, as F-16 fighter jets arrive in the region, Lieutenant General. Your thoughts about this? These people are about to have us killed, man. This is... Uh... Insanity. So let's go back to the interview with Tucker Carlson and Colonel Douglas McGregor. Sounds like our commander in chief. Okay, so we're here. That there is no room for negotiation, no room for mediation. Hamas must be destroyed. We must go into Gaza. If so, I think we're on this very dangerous road to Armageddon. What is the objective of the IDF and of, of Blinken, of the United States and Israel in this short term? Do, I, destroy Hamas. But what is what does that mean? But, well, to destroy Hamas in the minds, I think, of policymakers in Washington, as well as in Israel, is to systematically root them out and kill them in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Now, let's be frank, when you go into an urban environment, you can't pick or choose your targets very easily. First of all, no matter how well trained you are, you're moving into an area that is rubbled. They're ruins. It's very difficult to negotiate in that when I say negotiate, I mean negotiate the terrain through the rubble. You don't know where the enemy is going to pop up. Once you destroy all these buildings, he can be anywhere. So you're going to take losses going in. But more important, once you start going in there, you're going to end up killing whatever you find. Because the soldier, the Israeli soldier, the American soldier, very much the same, they want to live. They want to survive. When in doubt, pull the trigger. They're not going to stop and say, now, wait a minute, before I shoot, I really need to think about this because that may be a civilian or there. And that is a reason Iran will enter this conflict and make it a regional conflict. Because when the images and you just heard them, and this is what I was going to refer to, but I forgot I hadn't gotten to this part in the interview. He said an Israeli and a United States soldier. He didn't say a soldier. He said an Israeli and United States soldier, possibly because they get the same training. They're not going to they're going to shoot first and ask questions later. They're not going to decipher, oh, is this is, is this a civilian? They see somebody in puberty who looks, you know, a 13 year old. And my daughter's um, my older daughter looked a lot older than she was. I mean, it's typical for a lot of girls. But let's say so you're just shooting anybody who looks of age. Is the point that I'm making? So when these images start to come out of the slaughtering of civilians, that's when the Arab world is going to activate the Jordans, the Turkeys, the uh, uh, the Irans, the Hezbollah. Go. Or there may be a family there. That's not going to happen. You can't expect that. So the notion that this is a, a, a kind of warfare that is so precise that it can void, avoid so-called collateral damage is just nonsense. We can't expect miracles from the IDF or our own troops, which means that you're going to annihilate everything in Gaza. And remember, the Israelis would like to push the population out. The problem is when you push the population out, if you did into Egypt, you're going to run into trouble with the Egyptians. But even if you manage to get them there, you're only moving the problem that confronts you 20 miles, 30 miles away. In other words, killing people isn't going to solve the problem killing people isn't going to solve the problem there 
like I said, they go, or maybe I did. Did I mention they go into border stuff? 